Hello and welcome to Author Talk, brought to you by the Master of Arts in Science Writing Program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features Jamie Zverdzen, uh, who's told me how to pronounce her name six times and I still butchered it, discussing subatomic writing. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note, today's program will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the MAN Science Writing playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat function and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our moderator, Melissa Hendricks, who is the Associate Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Arts in Science Writing Program. Thank you, Peter, and hello to everyone. And welcome to this evening's author talk with Jamie Zversden. Zversden, Zversden, Zversden. Uh, the coolest name on the planet. By way of introduction, I'd like to share just a short story with you, um, uh, which goes back a few years uh, when Jamie and I, uh, shortly after Jamie and I had met, we were at a writing conference and we were chatting and uh, maybe the consequence of too many cups of coffee or something. Um, we were just brainstorming like crazy. Jamie told me a little bit about her background, which I found amazing and I thought it was unique. Um, it struck me that she almost had two lives. So on the one hand, there's Jamie, the writer editor. Jamie has an MFA in writing and literature from Bennington, and she was an editor for a decade. She's published some fun and brilliant essays in literary journals such as Brevity and Creative Nonfiction. So that's one side of Jamie. And at the same time, she blew me away when she said that she's also a scientist. Uh, she's taught college level astronomy and she's a scientist with the University of Utah's Telescope Array Project in the Utah desert, where she researches cosmic rays, those high energy subatomic particles. So as Jamie and I chatted more at this conference, she said, you know, those two fields, writing and physics, they might seem like different worlds, but they actually have something in common. And she grew very excited at this moment. And if you know Jamie, you know how excited she can get. And she said that uh, particle physicists who study things like cosmic rays are trying to dissect matter into its fundamental bits and to understand how all those units work together. And by the same token, writers and editors and grammarians and students of language are essentially doing the same thing, although the components they work with are, of course, words, not subatomic particles. And this was something like an aha moment, I think, for the two of us. Uh, Jamie said, you know, maybe there's a writing course in this. Maybe there's a way to approach grammar and syntax through this metaphor of particle physics, just a kind of fun metaphor. And at that moment, she just blurted out, you know, it's something like subatomic writing. Blam. <laughs> a course was conceived. And uh, since then, Jamie has developed and now teaches the subatomic writing course for our program. And now as a spin-off, she has this marvelous book, uh, Subatomic Writing, Six Fundamental Lessons That Make Language Matter, published just recently um, by Johns Hopkins Press. And uh, it's a book, I think, best described in the words of the inimitable Mary Roach, who has blurbed the book, uh, and Mary Roach writes, Jamie Zversden has written a quirky, quirky, marvelously helpful, relentlessly readable guide to effective science communication. Um, and that is just a wonderful endorsement and true. So I am very pleased now to pass this over to Jamie who will enlighten us on subatomic writing. 
Uh, just a reminder, please, um, for now, uh, stay muted and uh, keep your cameras off. When we get to questions, uh, we invite you to turn your cameras on. And in the meantime, please do feel free. Uh, Jamie also invites you to post a favorite sentence in the chat um, that uh, she, later in the hour, she and this group will smash apart those sentences and analyze them. And also please feel free to um, post any questions you have for the author in the chat. Thank you, Jamie. All right, wow, I'm already so, so very pleased um, that you all are here. Um, so we're gonna have some fun tonight. Um, you guys know that a lot of you know uh, that I love this program and I love teaching subatomic writing. Um, here's our plan for tonight. Uh, so post those sentences that you brought. The shorter, the better, but that doesn't matter. Um, if, if they're long and windy and you love it, go ahead and put it in too. Um, we're gonna go over, and if you don't have a sentence, that's okay too, uh, but you'll get more out of this workshop if you have a sentence. So hopefully you have a book nearby you can grab. Uh, we're gonna go over some quick fire facts. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the teacher, pedagogy, and the mind palace, and then we'll go subatomic on your sentences. So we'll, we'll cover the different skills in each of the lessons. The lessons are, they go from small to large, from the word level to the paragraph level. Um, and that way you can start to see how, how these skills interact with each other uh, and how you can build something that matters. That's, that's, the, that's our goal here. And then if there's time, we'll go over a diagrammed and scanned uh, sentence by James Clerk Maxwell, who is one of my heroes. And we'll talk about the, the final paper that subatomic writing students have to do <laughs> at the end of the semester. Uh, also in the chat, we'll, we won't do the QR code, uh, but we'll, we'll drop the discount code um, in the chat at the end and we'll do some questions. Okay, so quick fire facts. Um, I love MacGyver. <laughs> uh, MacGyver is a problem solver. He is cheerful. Uh, I've watched every single episode, all seven seasons and all the movies uh, while we were in the Marshall Islands. And it, it was really fun. To, <laughs> I, I'd laugh every episode because the last frame right before the synthesizer uh, comes in as like a, a freeze frame of his smile. And it just made me laugh every single time. So I, I love that problem solving attitude. Um, and I think we can all channel that uh, it, to some degree in all of our lives. Um, I'm married to an economist in the foreign service. My son's name is Maxwell. He acts as a semi-fictional character in subatomic writing, uh, as does my cat. As you see here, we also have a dog and some assorted fish from the creek out back. Um, Andrew's great grandfather's Lithuanian name is Zversden. Um, however, it has had many pronunciations, so I usually don't worry about it. I usually hear it as Zversden, which rhymes, if it helps, it rhymes with slurps gin or bird's chin, maybe that, maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. It means uh, pebbles or gravel in Lithuanian or the original version did before the great grandfather immigrated. So um, I kind of like that. Here are all the places I've lived, okay? Had to make a list. Utah, Italy, Belgium, New York, Virginia, Marshall Islands, Montreal, DC, Nicaragua, Utah, after we had to evacuate from Nicaragua, uh, Maryland, that's where we're at now, and we'll be going to Germany 
this summer. So it's been a whirlwind being in the foreign, being part of a foreign service family, but it's taught me a lot about um, how great people are all over the world and a lot about resiliency and a growth mindset, which I think is very important for teaching. Um, I am very grateful for all the teaching jobs I've had um, in various countries and, and situations. Um, Melissa gave a, a, a sort of a rundown of some of the things I've done. And if you want more, there's a, a website. Um, but I, what I really want to do is talk, talk about the amazing teachers I've had. Um, I've been so fortunate to have such great teachers starting at a really young age. Um, in fact, I have here the first book I ever wrote, which was fifth grade, Mrs. Caldwell. It's Goldilocks 2, the sequel, <laughs> in which Goldilocks goes to a dentistry and papa dentist, mama dentist, and baby dentist have all gone out on a walk. So she takes their floss, their toothpaste, and tries all their dentist chairs. It's a classic. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was fifth grade. In first grade, Miss Labrum taught me how to do sentence diagramming. And she was the one who really started uh, the, the foundations of what's in subatomic writing. Um, I, I owe her a lot um, and I owe my parents a lot also um, for, for that early teaching, that early learning. Um, Ms. Labram also had some sayings that she would say over and over and one of them just sticks with me still. She says, or she frequently say, I can't means I won't. And one time we even took, we wrote the word can't and we went outside and buried it in the ground. Um, that was pretty powerful for me, even, even at a young age. So I've been glad um, to have them and many more other wonderful teachers in my life. Um, if, you, if you write, you are to a degree a teacher. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a bit. When I was 16, I entered for cosmic ray research um, and got started in cosmic ray research. I uh, was able to get my job as a researcher back in 2018 when I evacuated back to Utah. And I have always loved cosmic rays. Um, cosmic ray is a, a high speed subatomic particle uh, that, that hits Earth, Earth's atmosphere. And as you can see on the right, um, it interacts, it, it hits some atom in the upper atmosphere and a whole bunch of other subatomic particles scatter out from that. Um, one of these subatomic particles is the pion with the neutral charge and that immediately decays into two photons being photons being packets of light. And these photons are what our detectors out in the desert uh, pick up, uh, which is pretty, pretty neat. So I love this, this very small world. Um, and we're gonna talk about quarks because cosmic rays are usually protons. It's worth remembering, I think it is anyway, that uh, a proton is one up, one up quark, another up quark and a down quark. And as we, as we build from quarks to a chain of carbon atoms through the lessons, um, you see how you can grow, grow something that matters by paying attention to all of these small levels. Um, by the way, if you hold out your hand, uh, a cosmic ray, goes through your hand once every second. And uh, two, two cosmic rays go through your head. <laughs> so, <laughs> cosmic rays, we don't see them, but they are still there. 
Um, they have subatomic effects on us. And I'd like to think that our writing has, has a similar sort of effect on other people. We may not always see what our writing does for other people, but I think it can do a lot of good in the world. Uh, I also love systems. Um, so I, oops, I built a, a PC um, and I love logic puzzles and language systems and programming and math. Um, and pedagogy is a system, right? A system of learning. So I wanted to put these anonymous evaluations up. Don't, you don't have to read them. Just, just to share with you that something in this subatomic writing pedagogy is working. Some guy on LinkedIn said, uh, don't you mean andragogy, meaning uh, like adult learning, not child learning, but I actually prefer pedagogy. I think there's a lot to do with play um, and tinkering with systems that is valuable. And speaking of, of learning styles, uh, Peter, the poll, if you please. Peter's great. What is your learning style? I don't know if you guys can see it real time like I can, but it, this is cool. I've never done this before. All right, we'll give it just a couple seconds more. So it looks like visual followed by kinesthetic followed by auditory is what we got tonight. I love it. Cool, thank you. Okay. So, oops, let me get rid of that. There we go. Um, why are we talking about pedagogy? I think all writers are teachers. Um, they are teaching the reader something, especially science writers, right? Uh, we're transferring information to the reader. Subatomic writing uh, is all about optimizing that transfer of information from the writer to the reader. When you are reader focused, um, a lot of great things can happen. Similarly, in teaching, when teachers are student focused rather than grade focused, uh, I, I think it benefits the reader benefits the student um, and we all grow and get better. Um, so I've, I've put this positive feedback up here, but you know what? There's also been a lot of constructive criticism from my students on subatomic writing and I take that seriously. And so for the past five years of teaching this course, it's been able to grow. Um, we just, this semester moved to Canvas and some of the, the Many possible assignments aren't transferring very well. So I'm working with my students this semester on best practices in Canvas. So we, we, we keep growing, we keep learning um, and getting better. Uh, so I wanted to share some resources with you. Um, the first one I wanna share is from student engagement techniques. Uh, this is where I got the idea for a smorgasbord pedagogy, uh, which is where we do some, some things the same, some, uh, sorry, the, the activities that the students do during the semester are the same, but then they have an array of other options to choose from based on what they need. And I love that because students know what they need most, and then I can help them get there. The second resource I wanted to share uh, is by Joshua Eiler, How Humans Learn. Um, both of these books were provided to me by the AAP program um, to be a better teacher and, and instructor. So I'm glad that they are helping us be better teachers. Um, the third one is, oh, wait, I was gonna say, this has a great section on play and how Play is a critical component to some types of learning um, and how it teaches how to be socially dynamic 
Um, and if you think about teaching and writing, both of those activities are socially dynamic, right? And so when you have an element of play in your writing or in your teaching, um, it allows students to have opportunities to fail without being, um, being catastrophic, <laughs> right? Like if you got a midterm and you got a final, then bam, it's, it's, it's stressful, right? But if you provide an opportunity for a low stakes failure, uh, it tends to be much better. Um, the other, there we go. Um, the other resource I wanted to share with you is Make It Stick. And I like this because it talks about mnemonics. Uh, mnemonics are a big part of subatomic writing. It's a visual model for picturing what you're trying to teach. Instead of doing a big information dump on your students um, or your reader, right? Especially in science writing. Um, then you're, you're providing a, a pathway that they can follow uh, so that they can absorb that information and most importantly, remember it. You want to have writing that, that people remember and that's one way to go about it is uh, mnemonics. So some mnemonics that you'll see in the book are visual models. We'll get to that in a second. Um, Well-organized lists. Uh, that's an ancient Greek mnemonic technique, actually. Uh, images are very powerful. So the sillier the image, the more likely the reader is to remember it. Uh, so you'll find some silly images in subatomic writing. There's a lot of uh, word play and mnemonics that you can use. So fanboys is a common one that you'll hear in, in grammar classes that stands for um, all the coordinating conjunctions, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. Yeah, fanboys. Um, and then there's a new one, a new word mnemonic in subatomic writing with pigs. And this is something that my former students uh, may appreciate, it's new. Um, and so that's pigs, pig stands for Participles, infinitives, and gerunds. And those are three really tricky parts of grammar. And once you conquer the pig, I feel like you can do anything. All right, so the mind palace. I know that the subatomic model is a little scary. Um, it doesn't have to be my 11 year old through this. And it can be easy as 666. So that's what I, I'm trying to do is to show that you can start small and then and build up your abilities uh, in both, you know, your particle physics knowledge and your writing abilities. Um, so what I want you to remember about this, the standard model of physics is that you've got three groups. You've got the bosons, which stand for the six lessons. Um, bosons are the information and energy messengers, you might say. They are the exchange particles that go between and among all the other particles and interact, and they pass along, they transfer that information and that energy. Uh, so they're good representations of these six um, lessons that we have. Uh, the second group are quarks. These are what we call matter. Uh, and it's divided into stable and unstable matter. You can sort of uh, see Max has written stable here and unstable in the other ones. A picture of this, by the way, a, a black and white uh, version is in the book. He helped me write the ending, which is kind of fun. Uh, and the, the two that we focus on in subatomic writing are ups and downs. If you remember the cosmic gray, uh, cosmic gray is a 
usually a proton and a proton is two ups and one down. And these are our um, ups and downs are what make up 99% of common matter in our universe. And similarly, when we write for other people, we want to use words that will make sense to them and that will matter to them. So we are, are making, creating language that matters um, by simplifying that which doesn't need to be complicated, especially in science writing. It can be very easy to reach for the cool science term that makes you look good. Um, but if you dig deep into words, you'll find that that information transfer and that energy transfer happens best when words are old, like Germanic old, um, when they have Germanic roots, when they're short. Um, and I think there's one more. You guys, if, if you guys remember, um, the third one is, I can't remember, um, but old and short are, are the important things with, with ups and downs. So these are the six kinds of, of English words, the most important of which are ups and downs. And finally, the third group in our model, our mental model, I don't know if you guys have seen um, uh, the BBC Sherlock Holmes with Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, <laughs> he, he talks about his mind palace. And so we're, we're creating this mind palace in subatomic writing to help you remember all of English, all of these little bits, and mapping it to the standard model of physics. Um, so the leptons are other little typographical bits and pieces um, that help you in writing the neutrinos have a little bit of matter still. So they're sort of like the spaces between words, the spaces between sentences, spaces between paragraphs. Um, and the, all, all of, there's lots of little bits, right? Lots of little things to remember. Okay, I think that's all I wanna say about the standard model. Um, there, the, there's various combinations that you can build once, once you have, some good ups and downs. And so you'll see me build from there. Okay, so let's start with the word level. I'm excited to see your sentences. Um, what we do first in class is I have them read the dictionary. Um, Max and I just started the, <laughs> the seventh edition of the Scrabble Dictionary. In 2014, I read the entire fifth edition of the Scrabble Dictionary. Um, I know that sounds strange, but there are really marvelous things to learn here. And you can build up your mental lexicon by just, you know, reading it casually. So some fun words we read just over the, the past couple days uh, are Ananda, which is extreme happiness, it's a noun, and iron, another noun, which means a metal support for holding wood in a fireplace. And let's see, nemosis is another noun, meaning the separation of rings of growth in timber due to wind. And where's my other, oh yeah, here's my other favorite. Anechoic, adjective, neither having nor producing echoes. I love it. Uh, so that way, when you when you fill yourself with words, also by reading other people's words, uh, you're building that mental lexicon. I have my students look up etymologies of words that they like and see where they're coming from. If if they're uh, more Germanic, that often means that they will be more easily understood by a reader since those Germanic words are the words that we, that native English speakers especially start out learning. Um, if you think of like the word see, um, that's Germanic, but observe is from the Latin root. Um, so if you find that you are overdoing it on the Latin etymology types of words, then you can pull back a little bit and use more Germanic, Germanic rooted words uh, 
to get your message more, if, more sent more effectively to the reader. Um, if you can find synonyms and, and practice uh, using synonyms, that can often help you with word choice at this level. My students uh, have a strange activity where they play with phonosemantics. Uh, this is a not terribly academic field of study in linguistics where, where there are sound clusters in our language that have meaning baked into that sound. So like even before you finish saying the word where we're, the reader can sort of get an understanding of what it might mean. For example, the sound cluster GL, gl, a lot of words that start with gl uh, mean or have the meaning of reflected light. So glitter, gleam, glisten, glow, gloaming. There's, there's a bunch of them. And they all have this, this underlying um, meaning of reflected light, which I think is really beautiful. Um, that doesn't mean that that sound cluster extends to other words that, that have GL in them. For example, glue doesn't reflect light terribly well. Um, so, so it's it's associative, but there are paths of, of etymology that are kind of woven through these sound clusters. Um, and in fact, if you if you follow the GL sound cluster back and back and back, the Proto-Indo-European root that has GL in it is a word that means to shine. So that that reflection, that light has been passed down through this this tiny itty bitty sound. Um, this is another way that you can infuse your writing with these just little bits, right? Okay. Um, another thing we do at this, at this level is talk about bright versus boring words, lexical versus function words, as we divide the English language into its, its smaller and smaller parts. Uh, lexical words are nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. And these are the words that pop for the reader. They're the words, the, they, they are the timber, as we talk about in lesson one. The rest is, is like the mortar in between the bricks or whatever analogy you want to use uh, for building, right? So the function words are everything else. And we do talk, we do go the distance in this book and talk about all of these things and how they, they work together and best practices and, and stuff like that. Um, but I want to go to your sentences now and, um, go through, let's see. I also wanna keep an eye on the time. If we don't get to all six, I'm okay with that. The, the first three lessons are the most important. Um, so let's see, I need to have a clock here. Okay, we're all right. So let me go back up to the top here and I'm just gonna say some bright words for a little bit. Okay, Julia Ma, explanation, usually, given, we, see, broken cups, gathering themselves together. So as, as I'm doing this, um, you, you can, I, I guess I should read what the, the whole sentence first. I'll do that in a sec. But as I'm doing this, notice that a lot of these great sentences have a lot of bright words in them. They, they don't have long strings of boring function words in them, which I think is really interesting. So if you're, if you're looking at a sentence that you particularly want the reader to remember, look to see the uh, balance of bright versus boring. 
Okay, so Julia's sentence is, the explanation that is usually given as to why we don't see broken cups gathering themselves together off the floor and jumping back onto the table is that it is, is that it is forbidden by the second law of thermodynamics. That's from Stephen Hawking. Um, James, my paradigm of modern physics begins with a viewpoint of universal wormhole observers. So uh, paradigm, my, Maya is an, um, actually I think Maya might be a possessive determiner. So that Maya is a boring one. Uh, paradigm is bright, modern physics begins, viewpoint, universal wormhole observers. Again, like more bright versus boring. Nick, what an astonishing thing a book is. I'm gonna just stop right there. Uh, Cause even, even that uh, we have astonishing thing book is. So already there are more bright words than boring words in that sentence. By the way, what I'm doing takes a long time. So don't at any point tonight, if you're like, whoa, I, I'm not, how, how, I'm not following or I'm not getting it, don't worry. It takes a while for these concepts and this jargon to enter, enter the, your system. <laughs> um, and if you, if you just take the lessons a little bit at, at a time, you'll get it. I, I like to be playful in, in my teaching, but I also like to be rigorous. I think we can do a lot better job of communicating with our readers. Um, so. Oh yeah, that was from Carl Sagan. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm gonna try to just get a, a piece of everyone if I can, I probably can't. You guys are awesome. I can't believe we had so many great people tonight. Um, one more before we move on. And yet there's so much in real science that's equally exciting, more mysterious, a greater intellectual challenge, as well as being a lot closer to the truth. That's Carl Sagan uh, from The Demon Haunted World, also a great book. Um, so in that one, the bright words are, so real science, equally exciting, mysterious, more, greater intellectual challenge, well, being, lot closer truth. So again, you're like, I... If, you, if you're looking at your writing and you see a long string of these boring function words, that's when, when you can be more concise. And that's how you can make your writing um, stand out to readers such that they will remember it and bring it to a workshop on writing as their favorite sentence. Okay, so moving on, we're going to move to level two now. In the book, I give an example, uh, a visual little story um, of nests and how my colleagues and I, Jihi and Ricardo and I, went out to the desert and went to go see why this scintillation detector wasn't working. Um, and the reason it wasn't working was because it was covered in bird feces and it had this abandoned nest. Um, so <laughs> uh, I, we had to clean it a lot and it was, it was pretty intense. But uh, we were able to extract the nest and, um, and fix it. I'm not seeing my screen at the moment. So, oh, I'm still going, I'm good. Okay. Just checking, make sure I'm not talking into the void. I, I can't wait till we get to questions uh, at the end so I can see faces and have a little more interaction here. Uh, anyhow, the, the story that's in the book is here in this picture. That's the huge nest that I'm referencing. It's such a big nest that other nests can fit inside of it. And in the English language, we have recursion, uh, which means nests and nests and nests. And uh, you know, a sentence like they said, 
that he said that she said that they said that he said that she said it can go on for a really long time uh when we fit phrases into other phrases and closet it, it's it can be just iterative uh Kind of a funny thing, if you if you look at the etymology of nest, it's Germanic, uh, and it means to sit. But if you look at the etymology of recursion, uh, it's Latin, uh, recurrere. I took Latin in college. I just, I love it. Um, and that means to run. So we, we have to sit in German and to run in English. So <laughs> two, two ideas that um that mean the same thing in our case but totally different things in their etymologies so at this level we are nesting we we are grouping words into phrases and these are noun phrases verb phrases prepositional phrases and of assorted other ones all right so let's see claire's sentence Mouthless and gutless, the osidex is nonetheless insatiable. It eats through its feet, which extend like trickling roots into the marrow. That's good. Uh, so we have mouthless and gutless, um, which are both adjectives um, acting as adjectives here. So that's an adjective phrase. And then we have the osidex is a noun phrase, is, is in its own little verb phrase. Sometimes phrases can have just one word in them, which I know is confusing. Um, oh, but nonetheless, let's see. Nonetheless is, I believe, an adverb. So it that adverb would be modifying the verb phrase. So those two are together. Insatiable is its own adjective phrase. Um, and then we have, let's see, through its feet, that's a prepositional phrase. And then we get uh, like trickling roots, that's another prepositional phrase, into the marrow, another prepositional phrase. Um, so you can see uh, that all of these, uh, we'll see an example later on with James Clerk Maxwell, uh, where you can have, you know, it's almost like trickling waterfalls when you diagram the sentence and you can see how these phrases fit inside each other. If you, if you start having like a whole bunch of crazy recursive things going on when you diagram a sentence, you know that you need to unnest a little bit. So we just like being concise at the word level is important. You sometimes need to unnest. Um, so that is another subatomic skill that we can have. Um, oh, I've got a clip. There we go. Okay, now we move to lesson three. Lesson three is the hardest, I won't lie. Um, and we're, I'm just gonna share very briefly um, Let's see here. I'm gonna share my tablet. Let me see if this works here. All right. I think you can see that. So this is Diagramming with Jamie. <laughs> it's kind of like painting with Bob Ross, <laughs> but maybe a little nerdier. Um, so when we diagram sentences in subatomic writing, uh, it can be tough. It can be hard at first, but the more you do it, the more fun it gets. Um, the, the principle is that you slide your words, you slide phrases, you slide clauses even into these slots. And you have these valency patterns with the number of slots um, on, a, on a line. So that's what I mean by valency pattern. Um, 
there's a great, well, I guess I'm biased. I think it's great. <laughs> there's a great table on page 115 of the book um, that has these different valency patterns. Um, I, the, a lot of what you see in subatomic writing uh, is a combination of what I learned when I did editing stuff um, and including linguistics. So that can be, um, it, it, it does, it, get, it gets into the weeds for sure, but I think those weeds can be very beautiful and make, make these little differences in your writing. So when you diagram, you have your subject in one slot. You can see that here. And you've got your verb or verb phrase in this slot. And you've got um, other, other, in this case, it's, it's a direct object. Um, so I love food would be subject, verb, direct object, or S-V-D-O. Um, I try to have abbreviations for everything. I know that it can seem like, whoa, she's, she's abbreviating everything. But once you have an understanding of what those abbreviations are, you can put, you can, you can, you can see how these particles are interacting at the clause level and you can visualize it. A lot of you said that you were visual learners. Um, the art and practice of sentence diagramming has been a little spotty uh, over the years. Some people didn't like teaching it, others really liked it. It's, it's making a comeback, uh, which is fun. Um, in any case, there's, there's a lot that we could do with this. What I want you to take away uh, tonight is the heart. So, oh man, you guys, there's so many good sentences. We won't be able to get to all of them, but I hope you've been able to read through the chat. Um, I'm seeing awesome ones. This is really happy. Look for the heart in these sentences. Um, so let's find a couple hearts here. Okay. Werner Heisenberg, not only is the world stranger than we think, it is stranger than we can think. Um, so in this case, uh, the heart of this sentence would be, it is stranger. That would be the core valency pattern of that independent clause. Um, the problem with grammar is the same as the problem in, in particle physics. There's a lot of names for the exact same thing. And that's what makes it tricky. Um, a lot of people are turned off to both writing and physics and science in general because of the jargon. Um, I hope that subatomic writing makes all of this jargon a little bit more accessible to you in a non-threatening kind of way. We don't need to be afraid of these words that that people have assigned to these concepts, it can it can be a lot, um, but once you have a name for something, you can conquer it. Um, the same is true in in science and in writing. All right, I just want to find a couple more hearts. Um, the the issue with with modifiers like adjectives and adverbs is that if you get too many of them, then they can start interacting in ways that you don't want and the reader gets confused. So if you trim down your modifiers and have a core valency pattern to make sure that that heart of the clause is there in strong nouns and verbs or strong noun phrases and verb phrases or strong subjects and predicates that I'm, all, I'm saying the same thing. They're just different levels of, of jargon. Uh, then you're gonna have a strong sentence. Okay, his soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. 
awesome. Uh, so the heart of that sentence would be soul swooned, right? And when you have bright words, really strong words, um, both of those words are Germanic, by the way. Um, when you have a strong heart at the core of your sentence, you will have a much better sentence. All right, I'm afraid that we need to move on. I could do this forever, but <laughs> you guys know that I can. Um, so we'll stop there. But those three lessons are um, the ones that I wanted to share with you. We're not gonna be able to diagram your sentences tonight, but I encourage you to try. Um, is the heart always a noun verb pair? It depends on the valency patterns, Lara. I just saw your question pop up. Um, it depends on the valency patterns. Um, so you can have subject verb and that's your core valency pattern. But some verbs have to take a direct object. And so then you would have SVDO, subject verb direct object. And that would be the heart right there. So it depends on um, one of, I believe, nine valency patterns that are in that table. Um, okay, want to share the rest of these slides. Um, even if we don't go into it, um, I do want to, uh oh, where did my slides go? Hold on. There we go. Because I want to have time to talk to you. But we got to the three that are the hardest um, and that take the most time to, um, to get to, or to like soak in. And now my presentation is going slowly. Okay, hold on. Screen sharing is paused for some reason. Let's see. All right. Are we good? Can you see, can you see um, sentence level punctuation? Yes, I think you can. Yes, we're good. Thank you. So just to briefly touch on these other things, there are tips for punctuation. There are really great things that you can do with rhythm at the subatomic level. Um, chat GPT fails when it comes to lexical stress and prosodic stress. Um, this, this lecture will be um, uploaded so you can come back and just um, see this sonnet. And it does not have correct stress. I think it's so funny. So the, the better you get at these little things, the, I don't know, it's kind of like job security a little bit. At the paragraph level, you are taking your sentence and making sure that it fits in the larger scheme of things. And you, you it, this is just sound and sense replicated at a larger level now. Okay. This is James Clerk Maxwell's sentence. It's in the book, so don't worry if we can't get to it. Uh, you'll see that I marked the bright words, um, the lexical words versus the function words. And there's more bright words in there. Students have to do a final paper. It's tough, but I challenge everyone who reads the book to write exactly 700 words uh, about science. And we're done. So I would love to take uh, some live questions. Um, and let's see, and we're going to drop the code in the chat also. So this code is good until December. If you've already bought the book, but you're interested in a 30% discount code, um, get one for your friends, etc. I'm delighted to share what I have with you. Um, and hopefully it can do some good in the world. Okay. Jamie, this is Peter. We did yeah. have some, uh, if you could go ahead and share some of the, the books that you were sharing at the beginning of the presentation. Okay. Student engagement techniques 
is A Handbook for College Faculty by Elizabeth F. Barkley. How Humans Learn is by Joshua R. Eiler, The Science and Stories Behind Effective College Teaching. And the third one was Make It Stick with the Nice Blue Color, which is my favorite color. You probably can tell. <laughs> All right, another question. Jamie, there's a question in the chat from uh, Michelle again. How would you explain a linguistic master who didn't have this formal training? How would you explain a linguistic master who didn't have- Oh, a, a linguistic matter? No, matter. Michelle, are we missing something in your question? Yeah, Michelle, Michelle, uh, oh. maybe clarify your question and I'll take a question from Julia. Oh, she's saying great writers who are unaware of all these mechanics. How okay. can you- how can we explain the great writers who did not have this training? Good question. How can we explain great writers? Well, you know, is it, uh, I mean, have some writers just absorb these things without formally training? Oh, 100%. Um, or, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, because we rely a lot on sound and good writing often depends on sound. So if you're reading a lot, especially if you read your own stuff out loud, you will hear it. Um, native speakers do this more easily than non-native speakers. Um, and so if, if you're not a native speaker, it's a little harder and you have to learn the grammar a little more directly. Um, but absolutely, when, when all this grammar stuff gets to be too much, always go back to sound. Yeah, Julia. Hi, Jamie. Thank you for doing this talk. And I'm really excited to get into your book. Um, I wanted to ask, um, how do you recommend people read your book, um, like all the way through, jump through here and there? Is it more of a reference? Um, what, uh, what are your thoughts? Perfect. That, that is a fantastic question, because it can be overwhelming, right? There's a lot of jargon. Um, the way I wrote it was sequential. So if you go slowly, through it, um, it should build one on the other. And you're building from the word to a paragraph, from a quark to a chain of carbon atoms, which is that first layer of graphite in a pencil. Um, and that may work for some people, but it kind of depends on, um, you know, if, if they prefer to get an overview first, then maybe read it through fast. If they don't have time and just want to really understand sound, then go for lesson five. So I think depend, depending on what you want to get out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Julia, by the way, is one of my favorite people. She was in my AP physics class in high school. I happen to really like her. But we did not plan that. So I didn't plan her. <laughs> That's really cool. I am so sorry to say we are at the top of the hour. And I wish we had an, another hour because this has been uh, just such an enlightening time. And we have so many more sentences to diagram. And Jamie, honestly, you joked about diagramming with Jamie as competition for Bob Ross. But I think that would be a really cool uh, YouTube program, it would undoubtedly go viral. You should, <laughs> you should do it. Um, but uh, speaking of viral and YouTube, um, uh, indeed, this um, evening session, uh, a recording will be posted to our very own YouTube channel, the JHUAAP YouTube channel. It might not show up for a week or so, but it will be there. Um, and thank you all for uh, attending and um, contributing such great sentences. Um, I've just expanded my own reading list, thanks to folks here. Uh, I'm glad you got to the James Joyce, though. Um, Jamie, thank you. Applause to you. Um, thank you for such an enriching hour. Congratulations on your book. Uh, and, um, uh, and thank you for uh, your teaching over the years. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Very good. And lots of applause out there. Emoji applauses, as you can see. 
Ah, you guys are great. Really appreciate you coming. You could have done Netflix, but you didn't. <laughs> so props to you guys. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good night.